There are many great passages in the Bible. In fact, of course, all the passages in the Bible are great. But some of them we go to more often than we do others. There are some that we understand, at least for some of us, perhaps have a great meaning, a meaning that we need to be reminded of from time to time. One of those is surely in Paul's second letter to Timothy. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, the very familiar passage. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Here in the Bible, we find that the Bible indeed gives us all the information, all the instruction that we need to know what we need to know. That's the doctrine. To be what we need to be. That's righteous. And to do all those good things that we need to do. This passage is important for us every day of our life. And we certainly would not want to forget about this passage during difficult times. Those difficult times that we're facing now. In our lives, we have all faced financial difficulties. We've faced health difficulties, societal difficulties and challenges. But for most of us, the current combination is something we've never experienced before. I was reminded of what Joshua told the people in Joshua 3, 4. Just before he led them over the Jordan River into the Promised Land, Joshua said, you have not passed this way before. And I think that's true in these times, that we as a people, as a nation, we have not passed this way before. The combination of factors that we're experiencing now is unprecedented, at least for our generation. So this is one of those times we need to be reminded that the Bible contains wisdom for us. And the other passage we frequently think of is Romans 15, 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning. Our learning, why? that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Indeed, those things that were written ages ago can provide us hope in our age. In the wealth of the stories, the examples that are found in those books that we usually call the Old Testament, we can find stories that give us hope. In fact, we can even find stories that give us guidance in our current age. In particular, we can learn where we should place our focus in difficult times. We thank you for joining us in this Bible study as we spend just a few minutes looking at one of those Old Testament passages, a passage from which we can draw strength, we can draw encouragement, and yes, maybe we can learn what to do in these difficult times. The passage I want us to look at is Isaiah chapter 6. The first verse of Isaiah 6 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up. In the year that King Uzziah died, at first this may seem like one of those frequent historical references we find in the Bible, kind of a chronological peg point that would help us put this story in the context of the historical timeline. But in this particular case, that statement may be much more meaningful. It may have much more importance. The nation... King Uzziah, his death would have been a turning point. Uzziah had done much for the nation of Judah. Before Uzziah, Judah had greatly declined since his glory days under the reign of Solomon, under the reign of David. Through wars, revolts, bad kings, Judah had lost much of its strength. It had lost much of its luster as a nation. So against that background, Uzziah's reign had become a bright spot. Isaiah had ruled Judah for 52 years. Now, if you look in your Bible at the story of Isaiah, the Bible documents some serious personal failings in his life. But he brought Judah to a peak of prosperity that had not been seen in many years. And with the death of this nation's effective leader, now even the continuity of that external prosperity was threatened. The king that had been the focus of the people for so many years, who had been good for the nation in so many ways, that king was dead. So to say that it was in the year that Isaiah died, it's a lot more than just a chronological peg point. It was likely viewed by many, including Isaiah, as a time of great concern. What would happen to the nation? What would happen to the people? What would happen to Isaiah? And it was in this time of uncertainty, at this critical moment, 
that God did something for Isaiah. You know, God is the one who always knows what we need. He knew what Isaiah needed. Let us notice what God did for Isaiah. Let's note what, no, what God did for Isaiah and how it affected Isaiah. I believe if we look carefully at the effect that it had on Isaiah at his time of concern, then maybe it can do the same for us in our time of concern. What did God do for Isaiah? What God did for Isaiah is to put Isaiah's focus on the power and the glory and the holiness of God. Again, back to verse one of Isaiah six. In the year that King Isaiah died, I, as Isaiah writes this, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Verse two talks about the seraphim. Verse three indicates more about the seraphim. And one, one of those seraphim cried to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The earthly king was gone. God raises the focus of Isaiah to the heavenly king. And what a great, what a great and much needed lesson that is for us today. At our time of uncertainty, we need to focus on God. Are things in turmoil on the earth? An upward look will remind us they are not in turmoil in heaven. Do things seem confusing and in disarray on the earth? They are not in heaven, not where the power and the glory and the holiness of God reside. So in this amazing, this vivid, this detailed vision, Isaiah beheld the glory and the holiness and majesty of God. Just a couple of the specific references, the train of God's robe filled the temple. You know, the fancier the bride's gown, well, the longer is the train that trails behind her. The train of God's robe filled the temple. Maybe we should just think about that for a minute. And then it speaks of the seraphim. Seraphim is a plural word. We do not know how many there were. They were unusual creatures. Each had six wings. And what were these amazing seraphim doing? Verse three, one cried to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. What were they doing? Glorifying God, that's what they were doing. They were talking about the holiness of God. It also mentions the term, the Lord of hosts. The term used by the seraphim is used over 50 times in the book of Isaiah to refer to God. The Lord of hosts means the Lord of the armies. It is a reminder that God is always the real source of strength, the ultimate source of power. So Isaiah was reminded in a dramatic way about the power and the glory of God. And if we're paying attention, we are reminded too. And we need to be reminded. We need to remember that. God is the ultimate source of strength and power. But God is not just the Lord of hosts. God is holy, holy, holy. Over two dozen times, Isaiah refers to God as the Holy One. Now, the holiness of God, would, not just a sermon, it would take several sermons. Holy, holy is a word that means sanctified. It means set apart. It means separated. God is separated. He is set apart from all that is corrupt and evil. And we learn that because he is holy, we are to be holy. The book of Leviticus, we read God saying, Leviticus eleven forty four, for I am the Lord your God, you shall therefore sanctify yourselves and you shall be holy for I am holy. And the New Testament, the apostle Peter in first Peter chapter one refers to that same statement about God because it's still true. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. What we see here in Isaiah chapter six is one of the things we most need to know. One of the things we most need to remember about God, and that is his holiness. Understanding God's holiness can help us. When we find ourselves in difficult times, when we find ourselves in discouraging times, we need to lift our eyes upward and focus on the holiness of God. Not just his power, not just his glory, but his holiness. Because you see, we can't have God's power, and at least for now, we cannot share his, holy, his, his glory. 
but we can. We can and we must have holiness. For us to have holiness is so important, maybe especially in times like these, because it is our ability to be holy. It's our ability to set ourselves spiritually apart from those confusing earthly things around us and to focus on things that are spiritual, things that are of real value, things that are of lasting value. It is that ability that will sustain us in our time of anxiety. So what did God give Isaiah? Just what he needed, a vivid reminder of the splendor, the power, the majesty, and the holiness of God. Now, what effect did that upward look have on Isaiah? Looking upward to focus on the holiness of God caused Isaiah to turn his focus inward. Verse five, Isaiah said, woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. For five chapters, Isaiah has been preaching to the people. He has been telling them that they need to change their lives. They need to change their lives for the better. But now we see that Isaiah understood that he needed to make some changes too. Many in Isaiah's position would have felt self-righteous because the people around him were so bad. But not Isaiah. Isaiah also needed to be better and he knew it. And focusing on God cannot, at least it should not, focusing on God should not fail to cause us to want to be better to move further toward being that holy person that God intends us to be, to be that holy person that God calls upon us to be, to be that holy person that God created us to be. And so it was with Isaiah. So it should be with us today. That upward look led to an inward look. But that's not the end of the story with Isaiah. And that should not be the end of the story for us today. After he took that upward look and that inward look, then he took the outward look. Isaiah began to focus on others. Verse eight of Isaiah six, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Isaiah said, I said, here am I, send me. In Isaiah's day, God needed people to go and tell. He needed people to go and tell of God's power of God's majesty, and yes, of God's holiness. God prepared Isaiah for that mission by first showing him the splendor and the holiness of God. What a motivation. What a motivation to be reminded of the great and the good God that he served, the powerful God that has all things under control. Isaiah saw God. Isaiah saw himself. And then, and then Isaiah saw the need to proclaim God and his message. The upward look, the inward look, led to that outward look. Isaiah said, here am I, send me. And today we really should have the same response. We should follow the same pattern. If we do not first take that upward look at the holy, holy, holy God that we serve, we will not find that peace that peace that comes from focusing on God. And if we don't first take that upward look, we will not have the right perspective for that inward look. And if we don't have the courage to take that inward look, then our hearts will not be changed. And if our hearts are not changed, we will not be prepared to serve that holy, holy, holy God. And then we must take that outward look to those around us those around us who always need to hear, but maybe in this difficult time that we're in, they particularly need to hear about the holy, holy God that we serve. Thank you for joining us in this study. And please check back to the website or to the Facebook page for additional messages and additional sermons. And as you have opportunity, hopefully in soon weeks, come and visit us at 501 Shirts Parkway. Thank you very much.